Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your probably very busy schedules to join us. Um, I'm super excited because we've got some great panelists here today and we're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about the arts at Clark. Um, we're going to talk about uh, academics, we're going to talk about um, student clubs and organizations that are involved with the arts, and you're going to hear from um, some of our amazing faculty as well as one of our current students. Um, and we're really excited that you're all here today. Um, my name is Jess Howland, and I'm the Associate Director of Admissions um, at Clark. And I'm also a Clark alum, uh, full disclosure, and uh, I'm super excited to talk about the arts because I think that's one of the hidden gems of Clark. Like, I feel like people don't necessarily think about us when they think about the arts, but arts department here is really, really strong. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna get started. A um, Couple things as we go. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to um, ask those. And don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Put your questions in there as they come up and we'll kind of try to interact with you that way as we go along. Um, another quick plug, if anyone's been listening to public radio lately, you know that they're in the midst of a pledge drive um, and they're offering all sorts of incentives for you to give money. Um, very similar, Clark is uh, offering this really cute uh, Clarktoberfest t-shirt. If you attend three webinars, uh, we will send you a t-shirt. Uh, Steven and Christina, you only need to attend one to get a t-shirt. Uh, so if you just want to let us know your size, we can definitely get you one of those. Um, all right, so let's get going. So I'm super excited because we've got yeah. some great, we've got some, <laughs> Steve's a media. Uh, we've got some great folks here. Um, we've got Steven Gerardo, who is professor of practice in the studio art department, um, which is part of our visual and performing arts department at Clark. He's been teaching at Clark since 1983, and he plans on teaching at least another 20 years. Yes, um, so any of you prospective students, don't worry, Steven will still be here when you enroll. Um, I'm also really excited to welcome Christina Wilson, who is a professor of art history, and she'll be talking about some of the work she does. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer she's going to be here, but I'm guessing it's going to be a few more years as well. Yes. So that's yes. awesome. Yeah. Um, and then we've also got Sarah O'Brien, who is one of our current students, class of 2021. Um, Sarah is a geography and urban studies major, and she's also really involved in Clark uh, Musical Theater. So um, any questions about those kinds of things, um, feel free to ask away. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn it over to Christina, and Christina's going to start talking about some of the work that she's been doing at Clark um, and some of the courses that she's been teaching and how her students are kind of getting involved in things, both inside and outside the classroom. Okay. So I'm going to let you share your screen now. Okay, good. Let's see here. Um, okay, so I hope everybody's seeing a picture of my cyanotypes exhibition. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so hi everyone, and so thank you very much for coming. And uh, so, as Jess said, so I am a professor of art history, so um, I'm embarrassed or not to say that I don't make art, uh, but I love studying it and I love talking about it and I love teaching about it and, uh, and teaching my students to talk and to research about it. Uh, and there's a way in which, you know, learning to talk about art is itself a very creative act. And in fact, that's one of the things that I try to instill in my students from day one in any of their art history classes. Um, so what I wanted to do uh, in the next kind of five to seven minutes is just tell you about one big research project that I did five years ago now with a local organization, the Worcester Art Museum, uh, with a group of undergraduates. It's a major research project that we did. Um, and I'm gonna describe how this project unfolded and what the work of the students was to just give you a sense of how students really get the opportunity to be on the ground, creating new knowledge, doing really creative work with their art history skills. Uh, in, in, the, in the classes that we run here at Clark. Uh, and then also to give you a, at the very end an example of how we're trying to make this not just a once every five or seven or 10 year experience, but actually something that our students can have in their courses every single year. So this is an exhibit that I co-curated with the curator at the Worcester Art Museum, the curator of photography, whose name is Nancy Burns. And uh, the exhibit was on cyanotype photography. Uh, cyanotypes um, are a kind of photography. I'll show you an example of a bunch of the kinds of works that were um, shown in the exhibit. Uh, cyanotype photography is a photographic process 
where um, you're basically sort of uh, relying, it's sort of the paper is prepared and then you can either put a negative or an object directly onto the paper, you expose it to the sun and then you wash it in water and you get this wonderful crazy blue image. Uh, cyanotypes were extremely popular in the late 19th century. They fell out of favor in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And then in the later part of the 20th century, they, there was a resurgence of popularity. Um, when Nancy and I started working on this project, we discovered that there had never been a museum exhibition devoted to the history, the complete history from the 1840s through to the 20 teens of cyanotype photography. So our exhibit was the first one on this topic. And our students were, I ran a class in the fall of 2015 and the students were dedicated the entire semester to learning about the cyanotype process and then doing a variety of research activities related to the show. And so I want to explain to you what some of the things were that the students were doing. So here they all are in um, a variety of situations. So they learned a lot about how an exhibit comes together. They learned about how we design an exhibition and they helped kind of figure out some of the layout. This is a model, a mock-up of the exhibition gallery. Uh, they learned a lot about how you, um, how important it is to sort of conserve and then mat and frame all of these different fragile objects. We talked with uh, experts in education in the museum's department. We talked with people who were designing the exhibition catalog and designing the exhibition space. So they learned all of the different, you know, all of the different professional lives that go on within the world of a museum that all have to come together to make an exhibition happen. Then the, the students also awesome. were tasked with doing their own independent research work. So they were each assigned an object from the museum, uh, from the exhibition, and they were tasked with doing independent research on it and then writing a short essay that was published in the exhibition catalog. Um, so it took a lot of work on their part. Um, some of them had to go sort of travel and do some independent interviews, a lot of, you know, reading sort of far-flung um, scholarly resources. Uh, they had to write multiple drafts and they had to peer review and edit one another's drafts. So here they all are in their extensive peer editing process. Um, they were also responsible for writing many of the labels that appeared in the exhibition galleries and they had to work in small groups on their labels and i think i can tell from this piece of paper that my student mary is holding here this must have been a draft label that they were working on here in that small group setting um, anyway so here is uh what the exhibition catalog looked like uh, and here's the table of contents and if you look closely you'll see here are each of the students in the, the um in the in our class and so they're all, you know, graduation year 2017, 2016. So this was all, um, they were mostly all juniors and seniors. And then as you go through the catalog, you know, so here's Grant Henry's, the beginning of his essay, he wrote about this cyanotype, or here is Mary's essay, writing about this lace print cyanotype. So it's this wonderful, real project, I mean, real product um, that was, you know, that available for purchase. It is the scholarly source that sort of covers this broad range of this particular aspect of photography history. Uh, and then here are just some more views inside the gallery showing you the exhibition labels, um, some of the places where the students were, you know, responsible for uh, coming together and drafting these labels. Um, what are some of the things that students learned from this project? I mean, they learned a lot, uh, but I think it's helpful to kind of itemize and kind of really sort of think about this concretely. What are some of the things that they learned? Or at least I guess I should say what I hope did they learn. Um, so I think one of the big things they learned is that no museum exhibition is ever the brainchild of a single mind many, many, many hands go into, my, hands and minds go into the creation of an exhibition. And so they learned fundamentally that all of this work is a product of teamwork, collaboration, taking critique from your peers, offering critique to your peers, being willing to revise, rework, listen, learn in so many different directions. 
Um, I think another thing that they learned was not to be afraid of failing. Um, their first drafts on their exhibition essays were not great. <laughs> and, they had, and they had to keep working. And some of them were scared, some of them were frustrated, and, you know, they just kept working and kept working. And, you know, um, you know, some of my colleagues said to me, you know, boy, you had an extraordinarily talented group of students. Maybe some students who are listening to this are thinking, I could never do this. And I would have to say, actually, um, I think, you know, I, I just, I really think being prepared to roll up your sleeves and being prepared to learn from one another and learn from the process is what it's all about. And the achievement and the high level of accomplishment that this group of students um, was able to succeed with um, is really a testimony to their hard work and a testimony to this, you know, buying into the process and really not being scared of it. So not being scared to fail, not being scared to get get back up again and try again. Um, and I think finally, the, um, the big thing that I said to them over and over again is, um, this is a metaphor I like to use a lot, is um, the metaphor of the iceberg. You know, that, that these very short little, um, you know, exhibition labels are just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a ton of research that is the invisible part of the iceberg underneath the water that you cannot see. And every bit of you know, formal, polished, published material that one encounters is only the tip of the iceberg. Usually there is so much that is invisible to the reader's eye that has gone into the creation of that piece of writing. And what the students were seeing is the reality that there's a, there's a lot of invisible stuff that the public never gets to see that helps make the tip of the iceberg truly excellent. Um, so I was so proud of them. We got great press. We got written up in the New York Times, the Boston Globe. Here's me and Nancy um, uh, in the uh, Worcester TNG. Um, and, um, and we also won a national award for this. And um, I'll just quickly say, this is not the cyanotypes group. This is a different class. I just wanted to mention that we have sort of, sort of scaled this down a little bit and turned this into a project that can happen in a different way every semester for our art history students, where they are collaborating with artists and writing up short critical essays, interviewing artists who are part of um, Arts Worcester, which is a local community arts organization. Um, and they uh, interview the artists and then they write up short critical essays about the work of these artists and it gets published locally. So this is the kind of way that we're trying to sort of allow this on the ground um, sort of research and um, creative sort of creativity through your scholarly research um, and sort of art history in the community. We're allowing that to happen on an every year basis in the art history program. Um, and I will leave it there. Um, I hope I didn't talk too long. No, you were great. Thank Christina. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, and I will. Um, I have to say, I went to that exhibit at the art museum, and I was blown away. Um, I it was a, phenomenal. It was a real exhibit that a, the regular person could go to. Um, and I was just blown away with how good that was. So, um, yeah, thank you so Sorry, much for sharing. I, I, I gotta, I gotta um, so, continue talking about uh, also this amazing exhibit. And Christina, is that uh, Christina? Did you mention the beginning? This is an amazing museum, also just a couple miles away, right from Clark. Right. And there we Worcester, have. Yeah, yeah the Worcester ahead. Art Museum is what? It's a mile and a half from campus. It is one of the best regional museums in the country, and I will say that it is. It's like our own personal institutional museum. Um, it is one of the wonderful reasons to come to Clark is to be able to just take advantage of this world class, you know, centuries and centuries of art. Um, it's just, it's just a mind-blowing collection. And, you, and you're one of a number of art historians that actually tap into its resources. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and so it is some place, and we also have free membership there.
gift. We do, yes. 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 So that's one of the what's the one of the many benefits of going to Clark is that your student or staff or faculty ID will actually get you into the Worcester Art Museum for free, um, which is pretty amazing. All right, Stephen. So do you want All me right. to just play the video, or do you want me to do you want to say anything about uh, it first? So I'll, I'll do the setup for the video. So okay. Uh, and and this is hot off the press. It's thanks to everybody here that we got to see this video. <laughs> so um, our wonderful uh, photographer who works for the University for Communication and marketing. Uh, Steve King um, frequents, um, I teach photography at Clark and you've I've been there forever since last century. And uh, we have a, a huge community of people that support us, other artists, former students, uh, faculty, uh, staff, I can go on and on, communications, where they, a lot of these people come down and literally hang out with us and our students. And Steve King thought that this latest project that I'm working on during virus time, and this video will give you a little bit of a, a back play on that. That would be fun to follow me around Worcester. And of course, it's social distancing, right? Uh, with a longer lens on his movie camera and uh, vide videotaped me. And that's what you're going to see here. And then, I'll, and then when we're done with that, I'll talk more about the project and how it came to be. Uh, but go ahead. I think that, that was, so Steve King did all, all right. of the video. And everything. The project was born out of my very first photo on a campus here at Clark University in the last class that was taking place. I said to them, with tears in my eyes, and I'm not exaggerating, um, but this might be the last class I see for a very long time to come in session for campus. And I photographed it. I started making appointments immediately after that to photograph acquaintances and friends at a social distance using the lenses on this big box camera that I work with. Our professors, what can we think and I can photograph your classes? Eventually, they evolved more and more to documenting modifications that stores were using, putting class up, or masks, having people go to check them in. All of those things became very interesting to me. You know, you see to the eyes and everything is limited, right? You're just looking and seeing just this. And what a challenge that is. All my work is about photographing things from the future, from people like that, and how we lived in the century. I am a person uh, that is very connected to community. I've always have been and always will be. In my teens, I started photographing my neighbors, colleagues. All of these people became collective family. And so it made total sense that when COVID hit us back in March, that I would turn the camera to the things I know best. One, two, three. So was that breaking up? Did that? Did you guys hear that cleanly? Because mine was all breaking up. Jess, can you hear me? Was that breaking up or was that okay? It was okay. Yeah, we were okay, good. So okay, so maybe I'm breaking up. Am I breaking up? Am I holding together? <laughs> I I heard it. Uh, it was very staticky to me. Yeah, but, I assume um, it was staticky. Yeah. So okay, I if, as long as I'm clear, and if I get weird or staticky, maybe I'll stop for a millisecond. Continue. Um, so. Basically, what you saw was just a snapshot, no pun intended, of me working on this present project called During Virus Time. And what I was saying in the video was that uh, back, I, okay, so I'm going to back up actually about 10, 11 years. So um, the, uh, my camera that I use, it's always with me, it's by my side. I, it has no sex, <laughs> it has no age, but it's still mine and something that's a part of me. And I work with it um, daily, weekly, yearly. And uh, for over a decade, I was photographing uh, our, my classes at the end of the semester, or our classes. I'd go into other classes around campus and actually other campuses. Am I breaking up? And now I'm hearing weird stuff. Okay. All right, good. So uh, I uh, was photographing near the end of each semester. I was photographing like um, that the end of November or the beginning of April when students were all really exhausted and tired. And I uh, felt as a teacher, and all anybody who has any history of teaching or, or, or prospects of teaching, your worst nightmare is when the students are apathetic towards you and they're just kind of like looking at their phones or they're taking cat naps in the back of the room. And uh, I decided one day uh, at the end, of, near the, near the end of a semester to record that just to show them what they really look like, <laughs> to also scare them <laughs> and, uh, and straighten them out to make it through the rest of the semester. So now, okay, so I've been doing this thing, I call the classroom series and it was getting some exposure. And then we have COVID and it hits. And more than ever, and any teacher here, uh, it was the most frightening thing in our lives. We're gonna lose what we love, the passion, our students, our university, and we're told to go home and that Last and final day, March 13th, I grabbed my camera, thank God I always have it nearby, and I photographed the last campus, uh, last, well, last, yes, the last uh, class on campus in my building. And, uh, and right then and there, I looked at the class and I said to them, I don't think this is classroom series anymore. I think I'm gonna give this a title and I'll call it During Virus Time. 
And so then we're all told to go home. And I started photographing anything and everything. I mean, I was photographing, uh, and I'll talk about this couple right here, which is amazing. Uh, I was photographing paper bags, because remember we were told paper bags might kill us, that the groceries that we carry them in might have the virus. So everything, everything that I did was new to me. And I thought about it and rethought about it and would photograph it. And I was also during that time, and I'm still doing, this is a pleasant project, visiting very dear, dear friends of mine, socially distancing, staying 10, 15 feet away, but bringing my camera with like binocular lens on it so that I can keep my distance, but yet still photograph them. And this is an older couple, absolutely brilliant artists. Matter of fact, as we speak, John O'Reilly on the right and Jim Colleen on your left, having a show at the Howard Yanzerski Gallery in Boston for the next month until late October. And I visit them every week and I'm just checking to see if they're okay. And, uh, and I'll make a photo. And so here again, talking to them off in the distance, sitting at my camera, laying down a few reflectors, made this particular image. And just, you have, you have others, right, that I gave you? Yeah, yeah. you yeah. ready? And I, yeah, yeah, go for it, yeah, yeah, go for it. And, I'll, um, and so then I made this uh, 48 hours ago. So this uh, is hot off the press. And I walked into a, uh, another classroom on campus uh, a few minutes before it ended, and I was talking to the teacher, I was talking, the teacher's actually in the background on the left-hand side, and I was talking about just this conversation we're having right now. And I'm looking around the room and I said to them, I can't include everybody anymore because we're just not like that. We're all separated. We're six by six feet apart. But what I can do is poke, poke, poke holes, poke holes into the classroom and find something that's a metaphor. And there was this one student, Jamie, who was in the back of the room. And here she is knitting away. And uh, which, by the way, is a big deal at Clark University, because I researched this. <laughs> and I, I need a little, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. So I sent this out literally all over the world. And a friend of mine who teaches at the Amsterdam said, they knit it here? And I said, yeah, you know, I've been teaching there forever, for like, you know, 38 years. It's always been a kind of a fact, not that it's disrespecting, it just gives them something to do. It's like chewing gum. They've always done it. So then I literally left my office and I walked into a classroom and there was a student in there embroidering. <laughs> it was working on the computer at the same time. And I said to the student, I said, hey, I got a friend, a professor at the end And uh, is it unique that we do this here? And she said, ah, we just love you guys. And we know that you understand. You know, we're all nervous as heck. And that th this is something that when we speak, we keep our hands busy. By the way, a student made me a scarf many years ago in my class. I still gave a student a B. I just want to let you know. <laughs> so just full circle all the way around. Here's a situation where when I was talking to the students, the screen, not the screen, the projector was shining in my eyes. And all the teachers know that, you know, sometimes we have to get out of the room and we're kind of blinded by this. And I thought, wow, what a great metaphor to have that blind us, but yet poke holes and find you know, the, the thing that is of great interest. And so the entanglement of the knitting, the spiraling of that, that's how I, I came to make this photo. And um, by the way, I give all my, all of the people with my photograph, eventually a photo also, uh, if it's a good one, if I made art. If it's crappy, then I just go back and redo it again. I know I gave a couple. This is in a hall called Razzle Hall. This was made uh, about a week, week and a half ago. And this is, I uh, walked into another professor's class, um, the um, media, culture, and art class, which is a great, great major. Uh, I would take, if I was back in school, I would take this class. This is like the coolest class, uh, coolest uh, program that we have, I think, in our department. And I'm, I'm, but we all, we all contribute to this. So Christina and I, we all teach classes that are part of this major. So I walk in the room with the invite of the teacher near the end of the class, again, about 10 days ago, maybe two weeks ago. And I said the same thing. Hi, my name is Steven. I've been working on a photo essay during uh, virus time. And I'm looking and all of a sudden right in front of me, right, literally like about 14 feet away, 12 feet away, was this student with a mask on, but a smiley face. And how ironic is that? So it's like, hi, your name is, oh, my name's Eli. You're the photo today. The rest of the class is off the hook. There's a few of you in the background out of focus. You know, don't move, just stay there. And I talked to Eli for a while. I had Eli look at the screen over my shoulder. They were actually in a hybrid. They actually were Zooming with some students that were uh, coming in remotely. And uh, I mean, by the way, this is a one second exposure. I don't like to bring in lights and, and uh, other kind of reflectors. I just simply work with the light in the room. And it's a darkened room because of the, the uh, projection. 
So I got Eli to breathe very gently in and out. And on the exhale, I made this photo. Uh, and I'm using that lens. When we talked about that, the longer lens, it was a sense of depression, a sense of claustrophobia, this whole thing of entrapment that you see in this frame. Go ahead. I, you want to, I think I, um, I think I think that's all the photos that I have. But if you wanted to share some more, you're welcome to share your screen. You mean you didn't put my mother in there? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just describe it because I'm just, I, I just have a feeling if I start looking for stuff. So just a, a few, I'll just go verbalize a few more examples. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, back in March, what was this, February when this hit? Late February, March, right? March. And my mother's 89 years young. She's amazing. And one of my absolute heroes in life, very supportive of the arts and very supportive of her, her three kids. I'm the, uh, the eldest of three. And so back in, in uh, the beginning, um, we, I would share uh, shopping for my mother. I'd go to the grocery store. Never ever go to the grocery store, by the way, with your phone and saying to a loved one, hey, I'm here, what do you want? Because <laughs> then you go down every single aisle, $450 later, including the green pudding or whatever the hell it was that I bought for her. She hasn't eaten in 30 years. So because I open my mouth, I'm getting this stuff. So I, I go back to deliver this food to my mother's house and it was always on a card table outside her door. And uh, then I would have to stand back 20 feet. She opened the door and I made photos of that. But then a couple months later, you know, like all of us, we got a little relaxed about this. We're not going to die from this necessarily. So or maybe if we do the thing with the masks or distancing. So I continued to record that. So the photo, the photo I was thinking about um, is uh, that we have our mother sitting at the kids table in the dining room about 15 feet away. It was a total reversal of growing up, right? Because when you were little kids, if you had the kids table, uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. You sat there and the big adults sat at the big uh, dining room. So it's a reversal, ironic image of my mother wearing a mask sitting 15 feet away at the small table where her siblings, now adults, are sitting at the big table. Um, the thing about um, actually practicing as an artist, and I always tell my students uh, that I'm an artist first, very close second teacher. And why I say that and why I believe in that is that I have to strut my stuff. I have to take chances all the time. I have to fail all the time in order for me to improve and get better, to bring this back to my students for inspiration. My students teach me, and I've been doing this for a long time, but students don't know that things sometimes don't fit together, so somehow they make them fit together. It might be crude the way they do it, but it's something that always inspires me. So when I walk into a classroom, I always say to them, you think this is about you? No, it's all about me and you're teaching me, so don't let me down. Work your butts off throughout the semester. I am a resource center. I'm going to give you history. I'm going to give you resources. And because I'm a guy that just stays in one place all the time, I know everybody. And all of these people, and Christina being in this group right here, Jess, you know, uh, they seem like they're a resource for me. I am not shy to pass the students on to these wonderful members of our community. Um, we have a very wonderful facility. We have digital as well as analog. We have the dark room, the wonderful red lights. It's some place that you feel safe in. I know right now I am teaching on campus uh, until we've been told to go home and knock on wood that's not happening yet. And uh, all the students do sit six feet apart, but they do work in the analog dark room and they work in the digital dark room and they bring their prints into the classroom. And we're very heavy, like Christina just mentioned, all that research, same thing. We're all the same ethics that we really work our students to the bone. It's so important for them to build up these ethics now as young adults so that they can survive in that big world out there. And, and what better place to fail, right, Christina? It's like, you know, this is the place, because we pick them up, we do. We brush them off and we move them forward. And, uh, and we take great, great pride in that. One thing, other thing I can say about Clark, I can say a lot of things about Clark, and they're all good, by the way. But the, one of the great things that I can say is that the relationship between the students and the teacher is phenomenal. And I've been, hey, kids, I've been around the block a couple of times. I lecture a lot at other universities and other art departments. And we are, and I really have to say this, we're the envy of a lot of universities. And it's really not so much facility. I always say you can just make things out of duct tape. It's not the facility, it's the support. And that's the teachers and your fellow students around you. And this is something, this is why I am not going anywhere until you tell me to go home. But I love teaching at Clark because I have never seen that get any less and if anything, it's becoming much more. And uh, so, and again, you know, Christina and I can talk, oh, take this class and take that class. It's really, you, you're taking the idea and you're molding it with all of these components that you plug into it. And the end result, and Christina and I can suggest, 
you know, a lot of our students go on to bigger and better places and get great jobs and they stay in touch with us and that we invite them back and uh, they share some of those glorious moments and the different steps that they've gone through to get there. And, uh, and it's all part of that big cycle that again, that is wonderful at Clark. It really is. Steven, all right, all right, so um, before I turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit, I just had, there's one question that I was hoping uh, each of you, Stephen and Christina, could address. Um, and the question is, is there anything unique about Clark's art programs that you won't find at other schools? Yeah, I was just thinking that Stephen had kind of started to answer that um, in a way, which is that um, there's, uh, there's a real sense of community and collaboration uh, that really um, is tight across uh, not just like the visual arts or the studio art program, but it is, you know, studio art to screen studies and then all of that to art history and then that to music and to theater. I mean, that we, you know, we're this department that has all of these very different um, artistic disciplines in it. I mean, there are five different practicing disciplines, theater, music, screen studies, studio art, and art history. So that's five really different disciplines. And then there's that additional major MCA, Media, Media Culture and the Arts, which, which is an interdisciplinary major. And all of the faculty from these different programs, we work tightly together. We care about each other's work. Um, and I think we're really, we're like a really good team of colleagues. And so, you know, my own, you know, my own creative scholarship has really been, you know, changed and grown over the years by knowing Stephen and by knowing other faculty in the studio art program and by knowing faculty in the screen studies program. I mean, it has really, you know, there's a wonderful interdisciplinarity and openness that I really don't think you see in other art schools or um, certainly not in art schools and and I don't think you see it in liberal arts schools as much either. There's a there's a real collegiality and collaborative nature that is that's really it's really tight. Thank you. Stephen did you want to add anything to that? I mean you know I'm just gonna give us maybe some um, examples uh, Christina. So I um, one of the projects very sad but very dear to me is that I documented my father for over 20 years uh, succumbing to Alzheimer's. And, uh, and by the way, it's something I shared with my students day one, uh, back 20 years ago, actually it's 30 years ago now, he died 10 years ago, that I started telling my students that something's wrong with my father, so I'm gonna investigate that with my camera. And I shared week after week, all the photos, for better or for worse, with them. And they were there by my side. And even years later, when, when um, he passed away and these students along off on other things. They wrote to me on Facebook and condolences and how sweet that project was and the fact that I shared that and I was courageous. So fast forward is that um, a year ago, almost a week, it became a book, uh, Davis Publications here in Worcester. Also what's very good, the fact that I actually got it published by a very prestigious publisher right in my backyard. That was very important and connected to Clark University. An incredible teacher, now an incredible friend, Soren Sorensen, who teaches in screen approached me a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, when the book was coming together and asked if he could make a short video, just like a five minute piece. Well, after interviewing me for a couple of days and a huge amount of support material of photos and my brother filmed me working in the nursing home for five years, Soren put together this award-winning film. It just won just a couple of days ago, the Massachusetts Film Festival 2020, uh, Best Short Doc, and it's won a few other awards. And, um, you, it will go public. Right now he's doing all of the uh, festivals and I'm beside myself. The publicity and the support to that, but okay, the whole point is, is that I collaborated with a faculty member. That's the point. And the thing is that I, I work very close with a theater professor, Gino Diorio, and we've done things together forever. Gino actually lives in New York City, but he also lives here at my house. And my whole house kind of looks like this room. Like every square inch is like stuff everywhere. So Gino sleeps within this stuff. And of course, as Gino being a very dear faculty member and friend, he's not short in critiquing my stuff all the time. <laughs> so he's living in an art gallery and he'll tell me what's working, what's not. He also wrote a whole play based on my life uh, from about 15 years ago that opened in New Jersey called Winter Rising in the Summer House. Um, I work with uh, the uh, professor and composer Matt Molsky. We've collaborated a number of times. And again, you know what? Because you know that it's an excuse just to be with you at the beginning. And of course, then you realize you're actually making something like art. 
and it, it gets even better. So this is very unique. That we, we have a brand new faculty member, I'm not gonna give out names, but this person just arrived on campus and this person said, wow, you guys actually like one another. <laughs> No, we, why, why would that be any different? You support each other. You know, you go to each other's openings, you know, publications, you buy the books. You, and it's like, why would it be any other way? And that's what we bring back to Christina. Like, it's not quite like that at other, other institutions, which I find a waste of time because we're having a ball. And again, like Christina just showed you, we bring the students into that. Uh, and again, what an honor that is. When the film was being made with dad, there were a number of students that were taken on as interns to work on it as well. Um, all right, so Sarah, I'd love to hear from you as a current Clark student, um, and while you're not majoring in the arts, it's certainly played like a big role in your Clark experience, um, especially your involvement with Clark Musical Theater. So do you want to take a couple minutes and kind of talk about how that works, and um, especially for students who maybe aren't necessarily thinking about majoring in the arts, but how they can make that part of their Clark experience? For sure, yeah. Um, this was something that was a huge perk for me coming onto campus. Um, not an arts major, but definitely a big lover of theater. How would I get engaged on campus? Um, so first, I love putting links in the chat. So I'm gonna pop a quick link in. Uh, that is a list of all of the arts related clubs on campus. Uh, and if you do kind of wiggle around on that site, you can find other clubs as well. Um, and I, I'm also gonna give you a quick visual on Clark Musical Theater I, instead of sharing my screen, but we do have pictures on that about page of past shows, uh, just as a visual to some of the actors at play. Um, but there's three things that I really love about Clark Musical Theater. Uh, the first one is how inclusive it was uh, coming onto campus. Um, and I mean inclusive for grades. Uh, so coming on as a first year student, was I going to be a part of the production? Uh, majors, was I gonna be an important part of the production as a non-theater major? And also time, uh, is this going to be the biggest part of my life uh, if I do not want it to be? Um, so I found right off the bat um, from the um, club fair that was uh, on campus that uh, the upperclassmen at the time were so excited to take us under our belt, not just in the uh, club, but also just as mentors of upperclassmen, like, hey, this is how you get into the cafeteria, stuff that like you need upperclassmen to know about. Um, and then also teaching us about theater along the way. Uh, so I'm a stage manager. And so I started my first semester as an assistant stage manager uh, and then actually became lead stage manager as a sophomore, which is a huge feat uh, for a theater club at a college. Um, especially because I was in the theater major um, and just as a sophomore. And I think that really shows how inclusive the shows are. Uh, from the actor perspective, um, we have one no cut show in the fall. So that's a bigger ensemble show. And then we usually do a smaller show in the spring that does have cuts. Uh, and then typically, our no cut show is about 25 cast members. Um, and then both shows have about 25 crew members, uh, which leads to my second point, which is leadership. Uh, something that has been uh, just so fantastic within Clark Musical Theater is the opportunity to really take charge of these uh, projects. Uh, so the way that both Clark Musical Theater and also um, Clark Player Society, uh, which is less musically, but still very theatery, um, both of cl those clubs are student led. Uh, so by executive boards, president, secretary, treasurer and uh, they are actually in charge of hiring professional directors uh, and we hire a professional music director and everything is done student-led um, from marketing the events to hiring and managing these professional staff members uh, and doing auditions and doing the club and all of the crew and lighting and sound and tech so there's all of those opportunities to learn uh, as well as our student pit so uh, members of the band and also just people who like to play instruments are also joined on stage as pit members so all of it is student-led and I think that is absolutely fantastic uh, as well as collaborating with the theater department uh, so you could see from the Clark Musical Theater website that we recently did Avenue Q uh, and that was a collaboration with the visual and performing arts department uh, so that was in resources and budget so we were able to bring in uh, more professional members uh, more resources the set was fantastic the sound was fantastic um, and also learn more about professional theater that way and more tech theater um, it was more of our higher 
production shows. Um, and then I think going off of that is just more support from the school uh, in terms of facilities and resources. We have a black box theater as well as a bigger auditorium uh, and more theater classrooms. So all of those are available for um, rehearsals and the bigger productions. And it's just been a, an amazing time to be a part of a club that's like probably half theater majors, half non-theater majors, half people that have been doing it since they were five, half people trying for the first time and kind of meeting in the middle and, and sharing knowledge in that way. Um, and it really does feel like, you know, as stage manager, I was putting about 12 hours into it, uh, but now I'm in more of a retiree position, house manager, which is probably one hour a week, uh, just sitting back and, <laughs> and letting other people take over. Um, so that's another thing is, you know, you can put your whole heart into it or you can still just be involved um, at a, a smaller scale. So it's been a blast to be a part of this program. Um, and I'm excited to share pictures and information with you and here to answer any questions about more just being a student on campus. Well, Sarah, we actually do have one question that's really important. What are some of your favorite shows that you've been a part of at Clark? Um, I have to say my favorite was Wedding Singer, which was last fall. Um, I stage managed that and it was the best call of my life. Calls are like from stage managers, um, lights and sound moving. And there's this beautiful last scene of the wedding singer it gave me chills the entire rehearsal period. Um, and I called the blackout at the exact right time. And it was just like a, an amazing moment. Uh, crowd went wild kind of thing, but it was an amazing cast uh, that shows my favorite cast. So that was probably the best show that I've done at Clark. That's awesome. Um, when hopefully we have, here's a future of more shows at Clark um, in whatever form they take. Uh, but here's a question for the, for the faculty maybe that you have worked with students um, in your time here. How many of your students have you know, majored in one of the arts and then gone on to do the fifth year masters in teaching? Does that happen uh, in your experience at all? Yeah, I think both, Christina, you and I both, right? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say in art history, in, in art history, it's probably only one every couple of years. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know about in the other majors within VMPA. I don't know for studio art. Um, I mean, they, a lot of my students, not a lot, but you know, one out of, I don't know, I'm going to kind of make it up, one out of 18, one out of 20. Um, yeah, mostly high school arts, grade school arts. Yep. yep. Uh, that they, you know, all of our classes are, are unanimously across the board so that they're well educated. And they'll take all of that knowledge and bring it into education. And again, of course, the ones that I know, is mostly the ones that go into the arts, back into the arts. They stay in touch with me, that's why I know that. Right, right, right. Yeah, so I would say it probably, it probably works out to across our department, it probably works out to one or two a year, like, but that's of all of the majors, you know, studio art, art history, music, theater, MCA, screen, um, yeah. What would you say are the numbers for students who end up majoring in the arts um, in a given year? Oh, either in total or, or broken down by, by art department? Well, it's definitely large um, because as a sum total. Um, I used to know this because when I was chair of the department. Um, I mean, so in media, culture and the arts and screen studies, each of those have between sort of probably 40 to 45. So that's 90 right there. Studio art has between 30 and 40. Um, music and art history and theater are both, or all three of those are between the 10 and 20 range. So anyway, those are, those are you know, ballpark numbers, um, but that's, and did I forget anybody? Or did I, I think I got everybody. Um, yeah, so anyway, so, so as a sum total, the department probably has, you know, has close to 200 majors right. in a year, but they're, di they're divided up across these six different programs. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I, we had one more question um, before I let you all give your final thoughts, but somebody wanted to know about opportunities for choirs and other vocal groups on campus. Um, Sarah, do you have any insight as to what those experiences look like? Sure, so we have a few different choirs um, and just singing opportunities. Uh, one of them is the chamber choir. Uh, we also have a cappella groups. Uh, so those are audition based. Some are more competitive than others. Uh, I think we have about five of them at this point. Um, so those are more informal clubs. But yes, we also have uh, Clark Choir, which counts as half credit um, towards your transcript as well. 
Awesome. So it looks like we're about out of time, but I just wanted to give each of our panelists kind of like a, a last minute or so to kind of talk about anything else that you think is important for folks who are looking at Clark to know about the arts programs here before we let them go and enjoy their weekend. You want to hear? Go ahead. Um, well, sure. I, I guess I would just say, um, a, reiterate a lot of the points that have already come up, which is that the faculty really care about the student, about our students, and about um, their ability to kind of grow and uh, and really nurture their creativity. Um, and there's a lot of great opportunities for cross disciplinary creative work. And the final point would just be that there's lots of opportunities to take your creative work out into the community. That's it. Um, and, and that goes in every program that we have. And that's a really important core value for all of our faculty. One last thing, and Christina, you said I was gonna mention we're outreach, that we really are Worcester community. The students really get out there. And we mentioned the Worcester Art Museum. We also have Arts Worcester, which is this amazing nonprofit organization, which a lot of our students end up working there the first year or two after they graduate from school. Uh, but we all talk a lot of, and uh, Sarah, you said it already, so I'm just gonna repeat you, is that we have a lot of independence within the institution. So we have these clubs, photography has a photo society that hasn't existed for 40 years, but a couple of first year students came in three years ago and created one, and now it's an institution within you know, st the studio program. That's pretty damn amazing. That's uh, absolutely stunning. But these students get to do that. And Sarah, by the way, I'm going to be working with you <laughs> through Professor Monroe. I just wanted to throw that in there before we leave. <laughs> I was talking about you this morning, didn't realize that until you came on board this afternoon. Well, I'm glad I could facilitate this meeting between the two of you. So <laughs> that was a nice <laughs> coincidence. Um, and then Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to say about your experience as a, a student who's not majoring in the arts, but has had made that, um, you know, a really important part of your Clark experience? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm here to tell all the students at home that it's not too late to try something new. Uh, you don't have to come onto Clark's campus knowing everything there is to know about photography or film or theater. Um, there are people, there's a lot of people trying these things out for the first time along with people who have more knowledge and it really is about just expanding on past loves and finding new ones even in college, never too late. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you for your attendance. We really appreciated it. Um, I hope you had some things that were um, new to you that you learned and maybe had some things reinforced that you already knew. Um, but if there's any other questions, like don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, you can send anything to admissions. Um, and if you want contact information for either Stephen or Christina or Sarah, um, please feel free to shoot us an email and we'd be happy to connect you with any of them. Um, but in the meantime, um, we hope to see you at a future webinar, but have a great weekend. Stay healthy, um, stay safe, and we hope to hear from you. Bye. Bye.